That's damn fine coffee you got here in Twin Peaks. A damn good cherry pie. Brilliant. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea what's going on. Hi there. So we've just seen a video in which Homer Simpson capably demonstrates something the psychologists refer to as the guru effect. Now, the guru effect refers to those occasions when we prematurely assume that something that is difficult to understand must be difficult to understand because it's inherently very wise or very profound. When in point of fact, when you think about it, something that is difficult to understand, well, might be difficult to understand because it's nonsense or because it hasn't been expressed very clearly. Now, there was a good study about this by Penny Crockett in 2015. And in their study, they asked undergraduates to review a series of phrases. But some of these phrases were common expressions that are supposed to convey wisdom, such as too many cooks spoil the broth. Other phrases had been randomly generated by a website. And they often used words that sounded quite sophisticated and sort of jumbled them together in a way which sounded good but didn't make any sense. An example might be wholeness, quiet, infinite phenomena. Yeah, superficially sounds good, but really doesn't make any sense. And of course, you'd hope that the undergraduates would be successful in spotting and distinguishing the nonsense phrases from the ones that actually contained real wisdom. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. They'd been duped by the guru effect. Now, of course, knowing that the guru effect is, exists is one thing, but what you really want to know is, OK, well, what causes it? And can I exploit it, you know, by making my work sound better in the hope that I'll get better marks? So having learned about the guru effect, it would be completely understandable if your first reaction was to think, well, hang on a minute. If all I have to do to appear smart is make my work a bit harder to interpret, then, well, pass the thesaurus. I'll just embellish the work with lots of long words and unnecessarily lengthy phrases, and that way I'll get better marks, right? Wrong. Yeah, I'm with Arnold Schwarzenegger on this one. Definitely don't do that. I'm going to invite you now to look at a couple of pieces of writing. And after you've looked at each piece of writing, just briefly reflect on what you think about it. And you might think that tutors, upon receiving a piece of work that had been articulated in this way, would think, wow, this person is clearly a genius and I should give them a very high mark. Here's what tutors actually think. <laughs> yep, you're not fooling anyone. Let's have a look at another example of writing which makes the same point as the previous example, but does so using much more straightforward language. Now hopefully you'll agree with me that not only was that piece of writing much easier to read, but it also made the point much more effectively and kind of concisely as well. But of course, it's not always the case that people that have difficult to read and impenetrable writing are deliberately trying to manipulate the reader's impression of their intelligence. Writing clearly is just a really difficult thing to do. So it would be quite useful if I could give you a tool or a metric of some kind that will allow you to objectively evaluate how clear your writing is. If you want to objectively assess how readable your work is, then you could do a lot worse than looking at the Fleish readability score. And you can find this in Microsoft Word. It's actually part of the spell check functionality. Every time you run a spell check, you'll get that little dialogue box that kind of summarises the results of the spell check. And one of those results will suddenly say something like Fleish readability score, and that's the one you're after. 
Now, just to help you interpret this score, the Fleece Readability Score is basically a score that indicates the level of education that your readers would need to readily understand your composition. Now, being an undergraduate, you're looking to compose work that would be readily understood by the intelligent but uninformed person, i.e. someone who's at a similar level of educational attainment that you are right now. And that means you'd be looking to achieve a score between 30 and 50. The closer to 50 you get, the easier it will be to read for the intended audience. Now, if you get a low flesh score and you think, well, this indicates that I really need to improve my work, in terms of its readability, there are a few things you can do. The first is to look at your use of terminology. If your work is laden with terminology that really isn't necessary and is only really there to make your work sound better, then, well, you know what to do. The second thing that you can do is look at the length of the words that you're using. If you're using really long and convoluted and complicated words, when simpler alternatives would be just as good and actually make the work a bit easier on the reader, then, well, use a simpler vocabulary. Similarly, if you're using long sentences that contain lots of clauses, consider shortening the length of your sentences and removing or reducing the number of clauses that they contain. If you follow this advice, your work will be much easier going on the reader and you'll get your points across much more clearly and concisely. That concludes this video on how psychology can help you study more effectively. If you've enjoyed the contents of this video, it would mean a lot to me if you could subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you turn on the notifications, you'll also get an indication when I produce new content for you to view. If you're interested in how psychology can help you study more effectively generally, then I also have a book available. It's called The Psychology of Effective Studying, How to Succeed in Your Degree, and it's available from all good bookshops online and on the high street. Thank you.